What's up, everybody? Welcome to Kind of Funny Games Daily for Tuesday, October 17th, 2017. I'm one of your hosts, Greg Miller, alongside the busiest lady in the business, Andrea Renee. What's good, Greg? Nothing. I like this outfit. There's another good outfit. Thank this you. Is like, I'm not saying low key, Andrea, but it's more, you know, you're not in the dress. You're not here yeah. to totally outclass me. Now this you're just is here my uh, Haunted Mansion tank top that I got from Disneyland. Oh, okay. It says foolish mortal on it. Okay. How was the haunted mansion at Disneyland? Well, it's all done up for Halloween right, right now. I, I actually they call it Mickey's spooktacular Halloween. You know, land. I've actually never seen it during Halloween. I've okay. only gone when it's, you know, it's classic form. And this is good? Yeah. I mean, it's like old school Disneyland. Sure. It's great. Okay. It's really just a, a, a nice, quiet place to sit in the dark air conditioning when you're tired of standing in lines at Disneyland. Well, that's, oh, okay. That makes more sense than I was going to yeah. say. I, when, I thought you were going to say in Anaheim. And I was going to say, I go sit in the uh, Portillo's. They have air conditioning. They and do. do. And they have delicious, delicious foods. If you didn't know, ladies and gentlemen, this is Kind of Funny Games Daily. Each and every weekday on a variety of platforms, we run you through the nerdy news you need to know about in the video game world before giving you perspective, our opinions, answering your questions, having a good time, and mainly hanging out with you. If you like that, you should be part of the show. Write in to your questions, comments, and concerns to kindoffunny.com slash KFGD. You can watch us record it live on twitch.tv slash kindoffunnygames. However, we don't look at the chat because we're making a polished podcast. Instead, it's your job to keep us straight if we screw anything up. You need to go to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong when you're there. Tell us what we screwed up, not editorializing stuff. You want to contribute to the show with a question or something like that? You write in to kindoffunny.com slash KFGD. Kind of funny.com slash you're wrong is strictly capitalist pig telling us what we got wrong factually. <laughs> uh, that way we can keep the record straight for everybody listening later on youtube.com slash kind of funny dot com. No, youtube.com slash kind of funny games. There's a lot of movement behind the camera, and I won't lie to you, it's really fucking me up. Breaking news. What is the breaking oh, news? Oh shit. <gasps> no what? way! That's no way! Fuck everything. The Roper Report is here. It has five items. The breaking news is this. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> oh my god! Sorry, this is the first. We've never had breaking news like this on the show. I thought it was gonna be like a bullshit Tim story. It's a real story. It's just I, that's really tra kind of tragic. I'm, I'm, I've been passed a piece of paper from Tim Gettys to the Tim Times. This is from Jason over at Kotaku. EA shuts down Visceral Games. EA has shut down Visceral Games, the studio behind games like Battlefield Hardline and Dead Space, the publisher said today. The Star Wars game in development at Visceral will be revamped and moved to a different studio. Quote, Our Visceral studio has been developing an action-adventure title set in the Star Wars universe, EA's Patrick so how do you say it? Soderlund? Soderlund? Yeah, Soderlund. Said, In its current form, it was shaping up to be a story-based linear adventure game throughout the development process. We have been testing the game concept with players, listening to the feedback about what and how they want to play, and closely tracking fundamental shifts in the marketplace. It has become clear that to deliver an experience that players will want to come back to and enjoy for a long time to come, we needed to pivot the design. We will maintain the stunning visuals, authenticity in the Star Wars universe, and focus on bringing a Star Wars story to life. Importantly, we are shifting the game to be a broader experience that allows for more variety in player agency, leaning into the capabilities of our Frostbite engine and reimagining central elements of the game to give players a Star Wars adventure of greater depth and breadth to explore. Holy fucking shit. Wow. I did not expect this at all. Uh, I no. I'm looking at the statement on EA's website, and they they call it an update on the visceral Star Wars project. <laughs> the update <laughs> is that studio shuttered, and we're moving it somewhere else. Holy fuck! Is this? I'm and I get confused because there's so many. This is Amy's game, right? This is Amy's game. Yeah. Holy fucking so shit! So the statement on their website goes on a little bit further. It says a development team across EA Worldwide Studios will take over development of this game led by a team from EA Vancouver that has already been working on the project. Our Visceral Studio will be ramping down and closing and we're in the midst of shifting as many of the team as possible to other projects and teams at EA. Lastly, while we had originally expected this game to launch late in our fiscal year 2019, we're now looking at a new time frame that we will announce in the future. Bringing a new Star Wars games to life for every passionate fan out there is what drives us as creators. It is what has inspired us to deliver the massive new Star Wars Battlefront 2 experience launching in just a few weeks and it fu fuels our live service in Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes and then they just go on to talk about how, well, how much of an honor it is to be working in the Star Wars universe wow that is not something you expect to see every day from EA Star Wars and Amy Hedden, Hedden. It, it, it was probably 
you know, if you go back and look at all of the um, news that's come out about her game, there really hasn't been any updates. Not a teaser trailer, not a hint. She hasn't done any interviews or any press about it. Was the last time we saw it that EA where they had nothing at E3, so they showed us like teaser footage of everything? It was all conceptual gameplay, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I thought it was just because they're keeping it quiet. Let Battlefield 2 have its moment. We're, right. They're working on this game in the background from, you know, exactly. this team. Yeah, wow. This is really troubling. Yeah. Man. Uh, Andy Cortez is raising his hand in the audience. Remember, Andy, they can't, come you on, come talk come on over, they can't Andy. Hear you. They can't hear you all the way. They can't hear you all the way off there. Remember I brought this up the other day. I was like, where's Amy's game? And Tim was like, oh, it's coming. So here, here's my prediction. It's sure. going to be a shared, words, shared world shooter like Destiny. You think that's what they're transitioning all this yeah. stuff to? I mean, sense. they're trying to like open that we're opening the game up. It's like uh, you you're totally shifting from a single player story driven experience and you're doing this whole you're going to change into a shared world shooter. That's what I'm thinking. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you, Andy Cortez. I wonder if this has anything to do with the lack of hype surrounding Battlefront 2. Do you think maybe that this was planned and in the works for quite some time or have they maybe seen the writing on the wall with pre-orders for battlefront seeing how player base has dropped off you're going in an interesting direction with it my direction would be and this is and i again similar to yesterday's naughty dog stories i know amy right like i consider her not a, a friend like we're texting all the time but an acquaintance or whatever my question would be is it something not with her but is it something similar to what apparently happened with uncharted 4 where it seemed like, you know, granted there was a whole hullabaloo and scuffle there, but Jason Schreier's book out about that, at Blood, Sweat, and Pixels, right, talks about it just like falling behind on deadlines, not achieving where it needed to be, this, that, and the other. Is that the same thing that happened here? Was it, I, I would say it's, right, I, my first reaction to reading this, and obviously it's happening all live, would have been the fact that it was writing on the wall of milestones keep slipping, things aren't getting hit, and then, what, so what is this game? And they sit down, they pitch it, and they look at it, and you know, the head, the powers that be go away and come back and it's like, we don't believe in the vision anymore. We don't believe we're on track to get it in 2019, let alone the fact that I, cause I, I don't know. People are, st- do you think, feel like there's no hype for battlefront too? Well, I think there is obviously hype, but it, it feels like it's much quieter than it was when the original Battlefront Battle launched. Yeah. Yeah. And there's just so much other competition in the space right now. This holiday season is so crammed with with large, you know, tentpole games that maybe they're looking at it going, well, are we going to be able to continue to ride this Star Wars train? Because even um, it, it was, you know, kind of loosely discussed amongst some friends of mine who work in the entertainment business that the overall hype for the movie Star Wars coming out in December is not nearly as big as it was for episode seven. Sure. And that perhaps, you know, Lucas and Disney are seeing that they've oversaturated Star Wars, even though the fan base is pretty rabid. Like there's only so much you can spend on Star Wars content every year before you're like, hey, maybe I just need a little bit of a break. It's hard to keep the hype train going for so long. Especially when you think about the first Battlefront and then the first, you know, Star Wars episode seven. It's the fact that there was a drought. People mm-hmm. were so thirsty and you know starving for this content, and you get the content. Great. I don't know if you can match that every time with the amount. What, well, I think what, it'd be impossible to match it at the at the pace that they're putting out content. What's interesting, right, is the fact that I feel like what has got me excited for Battlefront Two, what has a lot of people excited for Battlefront Two, is the single player campaign. And I'm not expecting it to be the most amazing thing in the world. Obviously, it's written by Walt and Mitch again, friends. Uh, I'm ex- sure the writing's gonna be great, but I'm not expecting it to go on and be super in depth. It's gonna be a shooter, and I'm gonna run through and do it and get this cool look at you know what happened between the movies. For this in Amy Head and Game, right? That is, you know, going to be this story-driven third person. We're out here doing this. Uh, you know, it's gonna be a story-based linear adventure. I thought that was on such another echelon of like, here is the Star Wars game. That would be the game right. I would look to of like, this is going to be rich in the canon. There's going to be this really in-depth, robust characters. And so to Andy's point, maybe it was the fact that they, or maybe it's a combination of both. Milestones right. column are slipping. Right, column A, column B. Milestones are slipping, but also, is anybody beating down the doors for this? Right now, we're EA. What is, what's the big push this year? Games as services. People who are jumping in, maybe they, they did see this and were like, Single player is cool. That's not what we do. We want to get in on this thing and have a world where people run and shoot and do all these different things. But again, they're now saying that they're not going to hit their fiscal year 2019 projection. So we're, I mean, pushed further back than that even. Well, I mean, if they have to, if, if they can keep the story, you know, if Amy has 
hopefully written something really spectacular for this title they keep the like the guts of the story and then they just have to b- rebuild all of the gameplay framework that's going to take a significant amount of 100%. time and they might need to hire new people go in a completely different direction from a gameplay uh, point of view and that i mean is essentially almost like starting from scratch yeah 100 percent. wow what a crazy day yikes that's so sad. I was really looking forward to this 100%, game. hundred percent. Yeah. And that, that was the thing where it was when Amy left and went there, it was like, what a great fit. Give her Star Wars, give her an EA budget and let her sit, you know, sit there and make this game the way she wants it to be. And then to have this happen, it's going to be fascinating. I'm sure Jason will continue to report on what exactly is going on. What, what actually is the reason from his sources as he goes, but wow. It's also worth discussing that even though the Star Wars project was what Visceral was working on, the idea that the entire studio is getting shut down or relocated just because of this project is kind of sad. I mean, because the Dead Space games were great. I don't know. But that's the I mean, thing. I don't think we were ever going to maybe see that franchise come back, at least no. in the way that it was. But I think there was still something there. That's the. I mean, that's the big thing was where, like, you know, the studio behind games like Battlefield Hardland and Dead Space... I, I'm with you. Don't get me wrong. People there worked on all these. Battlefield Hardline wasn't a home run. People didn't love that game. In Dead Space, to leave it at Dead Space makes it sound like the team's been there the entire time since Dead Space 1, right? Like, that's definitely not the fact. Right. Condry and Glenn went off and made Sledgehammer games and are making yes. Call of Duty now. And I would assume we've lost through attrition a whole bunch of people to the fact that True. Dead Space 3 wasn't a Dead Space game. No offense to the people who worked on it. I worked hard. It just, I didn't dig it. I think it's less about the specific people and more about the legacy of the studio. Sure, sure, sure. sure. I'll give you that. Yeah. Wow. Well... Sad. Interesting to see where that's going to go. I'm sure tomorrow throughout the day, I mean, tomorrow you guys will maybe have some statements from people because I'm sure there will be reactions yeah. from other people in the industry today. Um, Amy hasn't put anything on Twitter, has she? Let me check right now. This is all happening live. Kind of funny games daily. This is how it is. This is this was fun. This is like the first time like we've had a real breaking news story come on and do this. It was It's horrible news and I'm sad about it, but. No, she has not made an official statement. Okay, well. As of yet. We will keep you updated tomorrow on Kind of Funny Games Daily because, of course, it's daily. Twitch.tv slash Kind of Funny Games. YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny Games. Podcast services around the globe. No matter where you get the show, thank you so much. Remember, Extra Life is coming up November 4th. Extra li- or Kind of Funny.com slash Extra Life. But we will not continue the Roper Report that has five items on it, including that breaking news. Do 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 a baker's dozen. <laughs> Number two now. Uh, Gran Turismo Sport is extremely limited in offline mode. This is via Ars Technica, of course. T- Gran Turismo coming out today. Uh, an interesting thing. They they have a whole bunch of flowery language getting in there, but then just jumping off the headline into the story. But let's not pretend like we weren't warned. In a blog post last month, Sony revealed that in order to ensure fair racing for all, GT Sport will require an internet connection for the majority of functionality. This connectivity requirement is to ensure that progress car availability and driver ratings are properly maintained at all times ours ours continues now outside of the quote now we know what the majority of functionality means colon everything other than arcade mode this means that you can take part in one-off races against the ai time trials drift trials split screen two-player battles and the limited vr mode and you'll only have access to cars and racetracks you unlocked while you were online if the servers are down or your PlayStation 4 is not connected to the internet, no other parts of the game are available, and no progress can be saved. This means you'll lose any in-game credits or level progression earned in arcade arcade mode. Obviously, online matches depend on the servers, but so, so, too, does the rest of the game. Stuff that has always been available offline in the past. Campaign mode, the career mode that includes the notorious Gran Turismo driving school, is off-limits while offline. Also unavailable offline, buying new cars, viewing your garage, editing car li- liveries? What is that? Yes, it's like, it's like, like cosmetic stuff that goes on the outside. Thank you very much. You know a lot about cars and words. <laughs> and even the, quote, taking photos of fancy cars in exotic scenery mode. The reasoning behind the move has to do with the link up between Gran Turismo and the FIA, the international organization that runs World Motorsport. FIA recognized esports are an integral part of the game, so keeping everyone saves in the cloud is meant to keep everyone honest and above board. But 
The move to raise eyebrows in the Ars Technica office uh, as offline single-player content in console games is rarely restricted in this manner. When asked why Polyphony Digital chose to restrict so much usual Gran Turismo content to online-only use, a Sony representative referred us to a September blog post announcing the change. Quote, The local save only contains hardware settings such as as monitor resolution, HDR calibration, etc. The rep added. That fucking sucks. You know, I didn't really think about how many games utilize features like this until I was playing Middle Earth Shadow of War last night Mm. and I suddenly got disconnected from my game on Xbox One and it said, you must be online to play this game. Shit, that one is too. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. I'm like, this is a single player game. Why do I need to be online? So it must have just been like a hiccup in my Wi-Fi or something. Yeah. And it like disconnected me and dropped me to the dashboard. And I was like, what if I'd been like in the middle of a huge fight? Right, yeah. That's, and that's the weird thing about, like, I understand, all right, my PlayStation 4 isn't my, uh, you know, my primary one's at home. So at work, I'm using all these different PlayStation 4s. I'm logging in. They need to connect the internet to verify my license to let me play my game. Right. Okay, that's fair. I get that. But Gran Turismo, this flagship PlayStation game, Shadow of War, WB's big tentpole game for this fall. They're going to put out these things that are single player driven modes and not have, I, I don't get me wrong. I think it happened with South Park or whatever, where I was playing and we cycled the internet or whatever. And so I just got a notification of like, Hey, you're offline. So like Ubisoft clubs disabled. I'm like, well, of course. Yeah, that's fine. But I can yeah. still play the game. Everything's still working the way it should be. What a yeah. weird ass thing to start doing. And I understand it's 2017 and I understand that we want to make, you know, Everything's a connected online experience and it's all cool. Well, this is what Xbox got into such hot water over when they originally announced the Xbox One at E3, you know, however many years ago, and why they changed so much of their online infrastructure because so many people were like, but my internet sucks. And there's still like many people, millions of people around the country just here in the United States, not to mention like other parts of the world that don't have access to high speed internet. Like the fastest they can get is like five megabytes up or down. And the idea that these companies are restricting so much content behind a, an online um, access issue is really frustrating. Yeah. Like like you said, 100% agree that if you need to, if you've digitally downloaded a game, you don't have the disc, you need to verify the license, sure, a, a quick online check and then that's it. But to have to maintain a constant connection while you play and then to lose progress if you disconnect in the middle is to me just asinine and the number of situations i've been in where i'm moving or i take the playstation 4 with me or whatever i'm playing at a friend's house and i'm not connected because i just want to play the game i'm already through to have a gran turismo pe- person robbed of that not able to do that not able to just continue their single player story or whatever really a weird decision that i think is like that downside of the how connected we're trying to get to the internet and do all these cool things because there's don't get me wrong the consoles being connected the games being connected to the internet adds so many nice wrinkles and cool nifty things that i really do love But then it's like the slippery slope of like, well, now this game slid way the wrong way. I would be more on board with this idea overall if they implemented some sort of cash system, meaning you could like Mm. once you play, that'll automatically kind of hold some of your recent data like in the cloud. So that way, if you get disconnected, you don't lose your progress up to a certain amount of time or a certain amount of data. And then it'll just constantly like auto clear itself as you progress. So So that way, like, if one of these things happen, like it's not like it's not such a frustrating experience for gamers. Yeah. But I, I don't know anyone that's doing that now. And if you guys know, write us please and let me know it. Well, I mean that's kind the of thing, right? Where it's like, when I play, and don't get me wrong, these are definitely apples and oranges. When I play DC Universe Online or Destiny or Division, for me as somebody who uses like 15 PS4s, <laughs> it's awesome that it's all in the cloud and right there. Yeah. But these are games that are only playable online, and I knew that buying it. Right. Many I, there are going to be people who buy Gran Turismo, and knowing Gran Turismo's audience, plenty of people who buy a PlayStation 4 for this version of Gran Turismo and don't understand that and get home and plug it in and don't want to have it connected to the internet or only don't have Wi-Fi or some weird thing like that. Yeah. You know what? Some weirdo out in the suburbs. Not even <laughs> suburbs, the country, right, Kevin? Mm-hmm. Kevin knows. Number three, I gotta keep adding now, and that's hard. Yeah. Even though it's just plus one, it's confusing. You can do it, Greg. No, it's fun. Are you still taking time codes? I am, but because just they started it a little bit late, yeah. they will be a little bit well, off. Well, I think we're trying to get Kevin to do it this week. Or today. Oh, Kevin, are you doing time codes? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll have to compare our notes. <laughs> I'm just saying. A minute 40 off is what Kevin thinks. I'm supposed to add a minute and 40 to the no, running time clock as I go? Just chill okay. out, Andrea. You're so okay. busy. You're so busy in the oh. business and you're a lady. Just stop. Okay, thank you. Number three. Sony Music Entertainment's got a new game label. 
That is correct. Sony Music <laughs> Entertainment has a game publishing label that is publishing games to everywhere, including Switch and PC. I digress. Let's read the, the press release from them here. Sony Music Entertainment has created a new game publishing label called Unties in order to penetrate the ever-expanding video game market with indie games, which are continuing to draw attention even within Japan. Recent progress in the game development world has made it possible for even small-scale production teams to create high-quality games. The evolution of digital publishing has also made it possible for creators to deliver their own titles to consumers all around the world, which spawned an indie game movement centered around North America. Conversely, this has created an unfortunate side effect where certain creative unique titles end up getting buried in the market without getting the proper exposure they deserve. Unties hopes to unearth high quality titles like these and utilize Sony Music Entertainment's vast entertainment business wisdom in order to expose them to as many consumers as possible. Unties will also handle PR and sales on multiple platforms. We intend to free creators from the myriad ties that bind them. <laughs> that sounds like I was having a stroke. The myriad ties that bind them when it comes to publishing their games. We also vow to make free, limitless publishing a reality. Untie's first title is Tiny Metal, a classic style strategy sim created by Area 35, a new studio led by, by spirited young creator Hiro Akai. Hiro Akai Yura. Thank you very much. That's why I keep you around. <laughs> uh, and if you're wondering, if you're trying to picture this game, ladies and gentlemen, Imagine somebody fucking finally did it and made a new Advance Wars. Get excited. Get hyped. Get ready to get hyped game. On November 21st, Japan, standard time, the game will be released worldwide on PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch, and PC. Tiny Metal's fusion of classic turn-based strategy battles and cutting-edge 3D graphics, powered by Unreal Engine, is sure to entertain fans around the world. Despite the fact that the game is built off the classic turn-based strategy genre, it's filled with brand new systems and unique twists of old favorites. What the fucking hell, Andrea Renee? This is confusing. <laughs> what the hell, Sony Music Entertainment? You just stabbed Sony Computer, Sony Interactive Entertainment in the back. I don't know why um, Sony's executives would allow the music group to start publishing video games when they have a publishing group. That's very successful. The PlayStation group is so successful. Well, and they know the gaming space. Yeah. Like, the, knowing... Everything there is to know about publishing games is a lot of work and it, it is a team effort. I am very hard pressed to believe that the music group at Sony has enough people that understand the video game publishing space to make this a successful endeavor. And I think the people who are going to suffer here are the developers that go to work with this group. Mm. Now, I don't want to like like wave a flag like they're going to fail because I would never hope for anybody's publishing endeavor to fail because I think, you know, you can more say they're going to fail and hope for it. I predict this will fail <laughs> if that's what <laughs> and the, I do. The idea of free, limitless publishing, nobody wants that. The Steam marketplace already is close to that as you can possibly get, and it's full of hot garbage. Yeah, and well, that's the biggest thing, right? It's, made, it's talking about how you know we're going to get in here and we're going to unbind you so you can get through and like not get buried. It's like, wait, no. PlayStation Network, the PS Store is part of the problem of games getting buried. Exactly. Like, there, there's a different way to do this, Sony, than going out and making another label through the music group. I would be curious to know who was on their staff that is curating these games, what their experience is in the video games business, and why they think they're qualified to be hand-picking games to be published. Oh, they answer that here. SME's Vast Entertainment Business Wisdom. No, that's they got business wisdom, Andrea. It's fine. No, I need names. Oh, you, don't worry about that. Just there's, I mean, Sony Music Entertainment. You know how well the music division's doing lately oh and everything else. Oh my goodness! Don't worry about this it. This is the weirdest story I think I I've would read. love to be a fly on the wall PlayStation. Because I, I, as soon as I read this this morning, and I'm like, I'm drinking my coffee and I'm like, this strikes me very much as. Sean Layden opened his email and he's like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, no, what the hell? Why didn't anyone come talk to us about this? Which is interesting because I know Sony's whole one thing and Kaz and all that. Like everybody, everybody's talking like they're all talking to each other. But really, nobody at PlayStation was like, hey, wait a second. Why, why are you doing this from the music division? I wonder if there's a blog post On the about PlayStation this. Blog? Yeah. That would, if there is, go ahead and check. If, if there wasn't look. this morning when I went and did my rounds. I go to Gaff. I say, what do you gaffers know? I go to the Reddit. I go to PlayStation. I go to Xbox, then I start going to the sites. See what's up. What do you got, IGN, GameSpot, Kotaku? Then Jason's doing this stuff as soon as I sit down. <laughs> that was that was crazy. I've never seen Tim walk in, walk in here with a piece of paper being like, OMG. Breaking news. I was like, oh, God, what fucking Digimon got announced for whatever in fucking Nintendo Land? Um, nothing on PlayStation blog? Nope. It's a weird one. I hope the, the Tiny Metal game, 
All right, cool. It's got even the, even the box art kind of looks like Advance Wars or whatever the art they show, the key art. Yeah. I and mean, they showed gameplay screens and it was like that. Mm, well, that doesn't look great. But if it's just more Advance Wars, I don't care what it looks like. Bewildering thing. <laughs> we don't understand business. I say that all the time. It's interesting that like the first graph mentions, you know, which are continue to draw attention even within Japan. So you wonder if this is a more japanese fo focus things and they make a point to say you know when they're talking about indie games in graph 2 which spawned an indie game movement centered around north america it's yeah these these are japanese games and it was interesting the polygon Good article point. about this story they say it may be strange to see sony's name attached to a nintendo game but this isn't the first time that a competitor has published a title for a rival platform of course uh we know about microsoft minecraft but they say sony helped publish super nintendo games under its image soft label back before the playstation era before the PlayStation era and even Minecraft it's like alright that's different like yeah. that's still Xbox game you know Microsoft gaming putting well, they, out. yeah it, Minecraft was published on PlayStation before Xbox bought yeah. Minecraft and they don't want to cut off that bewildering another one to watch and see what happens November 21st though we'll find out if this tiny metal game is any good <laughs> uh, number three the UK government has responded about loot crates however this is not about the thing that got submitted to the UK government yesterday that petition about loot crates what? Oh, it's number four. I didn't do the addition. Thank you very much, Kevin. Number four. Thanks for keeping me honest over there. Don't bother putting it kind of funny.com slash you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> this is Eurogamer, right? Over a week ago, the Labor MP for Cambridge submitted two written questions on behalf of Reddit user and constituent Art Funkel. Again, this is 2017 you're living in, clearly. Uh, the questions were what you'd expect. How is the government going to handle this? Are we going to protect each other? Kind of thing. Tr Tracy Crouch. Parliamentary undersecretary for the Department of Digital, Culture, Media, and Sport. That's a mouthful. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a good title. Has responded to these questions on behalf of the government. The Gambling Commission released a position paper uh, in March 2017 detailing existing protections in place for in-game gambling, virtual currencies, and loot boxes. Where items obtained in a computer game can be traded or exchanged outside the game platform, they acquire a monetary value, and where facilities for gambling with such items are offered to consumers located in Britain, a Gambling Commission license is required. If no license is held, the Commission uses a wide range of regulatory powers to take action. Protecting children and vulnerable people from being harmed or exploited by gambling is one of the core objectives of the regulation of gambling in Great Britain and a pri priority for the government. The Gambling Commission have a range of regulatory powers to take action where illegal gambling is taking place. Earlier this year, the Gambling Commission successfully prosecuted the operators of a website providing le illegal gambling facilities for in-game items, which was accessible to children, the first regulator in the world to bring such action. The government recognized... I don't like how they're the tense they use for this these words. Recognize the risks and that come from increasing convergence between gambling and computer games. The Gambling Commission is keeping this matter under review and will continue to monitor developments in the market. End quote. Uh, back to Eurogamer. The government response is unsurprisingly evasive and appears to be ill-informed on the issue, citing the prosecution of two third-party gambling websites, despite questions being asked about in-game gambling. The responsibility appears to be passed to the Gambling Commission, while noting it is keeping it under review. However, the petition calling for gambling laws to be adapted to include video games with gambling mechanics has not yet received a government response. This is what we talked about yesterday in Kind of Funny Games Daily. Despite passing the 10,000 signatures needed to trigger this. At a time of publication, the petition has near, or has more than 12,000 signatures. So, the problem with this, let's get the government involved who has no fucking idea what they're talking about. We don't want the government involved. Like, I, I get the idea behind the petition and why you want to force somebody to take action, but there's a reason why the US, or the ESRB and PEGI and all of these other um, classification do? systems are self-regulated because when you get the government involved, it gets messy for everybody. Yeah, they have no idea what they're talking about. I can't even answer this question because they don't understand in-game gambling. I mean, and I'm sure people who play video games in the UK, many of which who probably listen to the show or watch it are like we don't want the publishing process for games in the UK to be more difficult because of some kind of government regulation yeah. I think we just need to you know have somebody maybe it's you know the regulatory boards you know discuss an what the publishers can do to you know make awareness more visible for this issue yeah yeah I, yeah we talked about it yesterday I yeah think it's just somebody ESRB, Peggy needs to get on the same page of like, this is what we're going to put on the box. We're not going to call it gambling. We're going to put in-game microtransactions that may be addictive or whatever the fuck you want to put on there. But hey, loot boxes are in here. Loot crates are in this. Beware if you have a problem with that. Seems like 
the best way to do it. Number five on the Roper Report. Kev, you got this time code? Oh, you're not even over there. That's why I'm doing this it. This piece of trash, I tell I you I knew this what. was going to happen. He got so... Did you see yesterday's disaster of a show? He cut it off early. He didn't know what he's doing. He uh, uploads the audio. And he a goes on vacation. He goes and gets his food. Number five on the Roper Report. <laughs> IGN's first humble bundle has had its... Well, so anyways, this is the first wrinkle is what I should call it, I guess. Uh, on the show this week... Or last week? God, it's only Tuesday. Last week, Tim and I were on the show about IGN buying Humble Bundle. That kicked off the question of the ethics of this. How do you review games like this? We talked briefly about it yesterday. Since then, a Hat in Times review went up on IGN, and it has a disclosure statement. Uh, I want to give a shout-out on kindoffunny.com slash KFGD to Sean Keegan. He submitted this. I read it last night, tweeted about it, got into a conversation with Total Biscuit that I'll bring up here in a second. But... I didn't it, it totally skip my mind for the Roper Report this morning until Sean, the man, wrote into kindoffunny.com slash KFGD. Anyways, I was kidding, Sean. I was reading the uh, Hat and Time review on IGN and following, and the following was at the top of the story. By Leaf Johnson is the, had the byline, and this says, Disclosure. IGN Entertainment, IGN's parent company, recently purchased Humble Bundle, the publisher of A Hat and Time. This technically makes us the publisher. Parentheses. We didn't actually know about that when this review is being written. End quote. Or end parentheses. Humble Bundle and IGN operate completely independently, but going forward, all Humble Bundle published games we cover will have a disclosure regarding our relationship, and we will endeavor to use freelance critics to review them when possible. How does that stick with you, Andrea Renee? I think that's fine. Yeah. Like we discussed yesterday, um, there is a, a large firewall in place between these two divisions, and as long as they're disclosing it, and I like that they went a step further to say that they're going to endeavor to use freelance reporters who are paid per piece that they write versus somebody who's on staff yeah. at IGN in order to you know make sure to widen the gap even a little bit further. I think that this is fine. I don't see anything wrong with this, but you're about to read something from someone who does find something wrong with it. Well, no, it's because it. well, I think there's just a, a sliding scale or, right. of all of this where I, I'm not saying, oh, this is great. When we talked about it on whatever day with Tim, it was the thing where Tim's like, this is a great business move for IG and this is great. And I'm like, I get that. It's just rough for me because for me, and this is old, this is old thinking from growing up with IGN, let alone working there of like, for me, IGN was... We review video games, that's what we do. And that's not what IGN is anymore. Not in a bad way. IGN's a million different things. It's Snapchat, it's Instagram, it's stories, it's WWE videos with me. It's all these crazy things IGN does, which is, I think, a better... That's when we start getting into the, the murky waters of trying to explain. They do a good job here, right, of IGN Entertainment owns Humble Bundle and runs Humble Bundle. IGN Entertainment runs IGN.com. It's not... Steve Butts isn't in charge of what's happening on Humble Bundle. He isn't suddenly getting ownership over that. Right. The people at the very top of IGN Entertainment, which are at the top of this, do that. And just as um, as additional information here, I pulled up a Game Informer review of Song of the Deep, a Game Trust published game, yeah. to compare their disclaimers. Um, game Informer's disclaimer says, Game Trust is the publishing label of GameStop, the parent company of Game Informer. All opinions in this review are the author's based on his experience with the game. So I think that as long as those disclaimers are being made, that's fine. I think what people are concerned is if there's a game that gets released that gets a, a very, very negative review, mm. what happens then? Is that score suppressed? Is that review pulled down? Do they not even publish that review? Um, we obviously haven't crossed that bridge yet, so yeah. we don't know, but I, I'm guessing that's why people are concerned. Well, the concern, yeah, is are they going to give them a, a point bump for this or knock them? And if they do knock them down, what happens if any of that was to come to light, which I and this is where I came back before and where I know it's that slippery slope of, well, I know the people reviewing at IGN. I know what IGN's mission statement, the IGN.com statement is in terms of reviewing and stuff and wanting to be as objective as possible and wanting to deliver. They would never do that because the, the fact that or the, the first time someone suppresses a review, the first time that because like let's say it was marty and they were like no no you got to, we, they changed marty's score marty's gonna tweet about that and ign's fucking blown away and it takes them years to rebuild that like it did for games yeah the, Stop. the idea that this is act this is what i talked about in the panel i was on this weekend the idea that this is actively happening is just so ridiculous that i i can't wrap my head around there are why some people out there are so convinced that it's true are so convinced that there's pay for play and that radiola is like a thing sure or excuse me is payola is like a thing i just like 
it just doesn't compute in my brain because I've just I've I've known so many of these people across so many different outlets for so long sure. that the idea of any of them, you know, altering their opinions because some kind of money is involved somewhere along the, along the way just is just false. I think for me, it's never and, and this is oh, we'll use IGN as an example, but this is anybody in general. This is advertising editorial in from at a newspaper even. It's never, hey, I'm worried about it right now. It's the concern of, well, what happens when the people, IGN loses Steve, they lose Dan, P- Pear's gone, the staff that we know quits, and that it is random freelance contractors. It is like this, it's just a, tr- it's a content churn. It's just a blog roll. That's when it gets weird of like, and right now even, the people who are at the top of IGN Entertainment, right? Like I know because I worked with them and they were my boss's boss's boss. Like I trust them not to fuck this up. But what about when the next CEO of Ziff Davis comes in and does want to fucking make more money? And do, you know, That's the thing where it's not even in the moment. It is a, well, what happens in five years when nobody's watching anymore? When it is just like, oh, well, this is how it is. I feel like that's dark future. It's such dystopian a it's shit. such a crazy scenario to to dream up and make yourself worked up about. How about we cross that bridge when we get to we it? We won't be watching when it happens. Anyways, last oh night I, I, I quote tweeted uh, this and said, "Good on you, IGN. Total Biscuit, friend of the show, watches it live a lot on Twitch. You were just on the Co-optional podcast. He's I've been great. on it before. Great dude. Writes in and says." This is fine retroactively, but they shouldn't be covering games their company published at all going forward. That's beyond disclosure. That disclosure is not on Metacritic, etc. It's but it's it's potential illegal. It's potentially is what he means. A legal issue at that point. FTC disclosure of pre-existing business relationships must be must be unavoidable. Metacritic publication would avoid that disclosure, and the responsibility isn't on Metacritic to put it put it there it's on ign we've already had this happen on youtube since ign is the biggest contributor to metacritic aggregation in the gaming space it's an issue they have they've dinged bloggers for far less however the legal stuff i asked about i was like how is that that's a little bit covered in there with the ftc and everything else he mentioned a lawyer friend of his that i reached out to today i hope to have a statement by the end of the week about it from him of like what is actually happening here what could happen here how this would be a legal issue because that's way outside of my purview and everything else there FTC disclosure, he brings up, is an interesting thing that is more and more pervasive, I think, in what we all do, right? Like, from if you ever, you've watched us do reviews for PlayStation games or PlayStation VR projects or stuff where it's like, hey, just a heads up, FTC, this was given to us by PlayStation 4 review. That needs to be said there, which I find super weird coming from editorial, but it's more of an influencer thing, which is a world that I don't think we fall into all the time but we do it's and that's probably a whole other conversation for another time where the line is between influencer and media but um i think everyone should be disclosing where they get codes from yeah. i mean if we're going to like make some people do it you kind of got to make everybody do it well, otherwise so it's there's always thing- a question of who's doing it and who's not doing it i get it. it's just i it, it's again this evolving landscape where i get it of yeah. joe blow youtuber doing this thing pops up and he has a review for south park right away I guess they're going to be like, you got to tell them that Ubisoft gave you that game so that that there is a little bit of, well, maybe he's going to be, I have to sit here and judge if he's been influenced by that. But for the most, I maybe I've just been in the game too long where I'm just like, well, no, how they get these games early? Of course they got them from the publisher. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. I, I'm also like of the mindset that I've never once been given something that I felt obligated to give a better score just because they Fuck gave no. me it for free. I get so many shitty games. <laughs> So many shitty games, so many shitty tchotchkes. We got a closet full of them. Come on out of Kind of Funny. Nick wants to get rid of it all. No, nope. Kevin says don't come down to Kind of Funny. We'll figure it out. We'll get it to you later. Um, so I hear where TB's coming from. Like, I understand what he's saying. I'm not that riled up again about it, but I do think it's because I came from that world. I came from IGN. I trust those people. And I also, like I said with Tim, I do think that it's just a movement of where we're going in, in terms of IGN Entertainment, this giant conglomerate that is touching everything now and like making shows for Disney. And that was interesting. People brought that up of like, well, they're partners with Disney. Should they and the, be allowed the, to review the Disney The really kind of comical part about it is you don't see movie critics saying, oh, Warner Brothers invited me to come see the movie so I can give you a review. And that happens all the time. It happens constantly. Well, and when they do say it, they say it on Twitter and it's like, hey, this is a cool perk of the job. I'm seeing the, game or, I'm seeing the movie earlier. You know what I mean? Like, right, but like I... 
I've worked in I've worked in entertainment and in, in movies too, and never once was it ever like, did the audience ever demand to know if we got the ticket for free for covering oh, sure. the movie. And I was like, I have to cover the movie if I'm going to ask the actors any questions about it because I need or I need to watch it and figure yeah. out like what happens so that I know what to ask. And what do you think I'm I'm supposed to just buy the ticket in advance? The movie theater won't let you do that, right. so you have to take the free ticket to go to the screening ahead of time. But like nobody ever talks about that because it's just not a thing. It's weird how in so. video games. The audience is so concerned about where the code came from or where the disc came from versus music or TV. Screeners happen in TV sure. all the time as well. I'm not quite sure what the obsession is with it. I mean, my argument, my, my, I, I think the root of the argument is, is that we're still just such a, a young industry and we yeah. are still filling all those roles where it is like, oh, I, and this sounds shitty and this is where it gets weird. So stick with me, please, really quickly because okay. it's going to sound bad. I never growing up watched Entertainment Tonight or when I see Mario Lopez on Extra worry about his journalistic credibility of interviewing these people for these shows, right? And you would think that would be applied to games, but as a games industry, we all are very much that this is a form of art and we have something to say and this is better than that. So we want to be held to that standard in a way, but it also is the same thing of Held to what standard? Journalism. That this versus is journalistic. Like, entertainment uh, journalism. Versus, I mean, but video games news is entertainment news. I know, but then so many times <laughs> it does come on to this real thing. And it does, I mean, it does for entertainment tonight too with like Harvey Weinstein or something like that. Or, but right. usually it's Mario Lopez asking Hugh Jackman about how he fucking got yacked. That's the difference. <laughs> yeah. And so, but it's this struggle of IGN Entertainment makes this move because they want to make more money and be more successful. I would argue that this happening, the advertorial content you'll see where, hey, we're doing crazy challenges and it's brought to you by Speed Stick or whatever, or Up at Noon is sponsored by whoever, or like, you know, like when we sponsored our studio launch by uh, Deus Ex uh, Mankind Divided. It's a thing because you, the old methods don't work anymore. You know what I mean? The reason newspapers are failing, right, is because nobody's picking up, no, subscriptions dropping, nobody's getting actual physical copies of it, so the advertisements in the pages don't work anymore, the classifieds don't work no more. You go to the websites, now it's a paywall. Well, people don't want to do the paywall, they don't use it. And it's this interesting thing to have video game journalism, video game press, enthusiast press, IGN Entertainment, is trying to find different ways to skin the same cat and do this. And that sounds terrible, but it is business. And this is one of the ways to do it. But what does that do to what they already do? But then if it's going to keep it alive and make it bigger and do different projects, who the fucking cares? Uh, can we never use the phrase skin the same cat ever again? <laughs> Why is that a thing? They say two ways to skin a cat. You know Wait, what I'm talking about, Wait, no. Kev. Why yeah. is anybody skinning a cat? I don't know. It's an old man thing that gets <laughs> Oh, my God. Kevin, you've heard this turn of phrase. No. Really? <laughs> Okay, oh. thank you, Kevin. Jeez, help me out, man. I've never Come heard on. that before. Sorry, my apologies. It's okay. But it's just, it, we got to come up with a new one then. Well, not right now. We're trying to make napkins out of the same tablecloth. That's what I'm saying. Perfect. There you go. <laughs> it's a complicated thing. Uh, and as I was, Total Biscuit was talking to me last night, other people were chiming in with the point of like, well, of course, Warner Brothers owns Rotten Tomatoes. And I was like, that's a pretty interesting thing, except Rotten Tomatoes really isn't reviewing, right? They're aggregating, and I'm sure they do have some kind of review podcast shit that I don't know about. But. CBS Interactive owns, owns Metacritic, Metacritic yeah, and they and also own GameStop or GameSpot, and they also own CNET. Yeah, both of which do reviews. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I think the thing is, it's like disclosure is the word. Disclosure is what it's all about, right? Like transparency. Don't do anything shady. Just. Be a good person. The one thing I want to sh shout out is Jim fucking Sterling son, who on his video he put up, he was not angry about it. He's just like, whatever, I don't read IGN, I don't think about IGN, this is something that's going on. But he brought up a good point of optics, that he's like, if they were worried about this and that and like what this is going to do, then don't do it because optically, because that was always a problem at IGN, right? Oh, you paid off for reviews. Oh, you did that. You're only giving this game because... That's never happened at IGN. That's a bunch of bullshit when I was there. And not that I think it's happening now, but you know, fuck it. Who cares? It's not all about I have that. to imagine that conversation happened. A hundred percent. Oh, what? <laughs> what? The optics conversation. Oh, sure. Of course. Yeah. And I think it's just that thing of Jim's point was like, if you want to go down that road and be the pillar of games journalism and stuff, then of course you shouldn't do that. But again, going back to what I was saying, I don't think that's what IGN is anymore. No, not that I'm saying they're not, they don't have ethics or that they are right. the place to go for reviews. I'm no, just saying there's so much great bigger work. Than that. Yeah. There's a lot of great stories and, and writing and features being done over there, of course, but I digress. Yes. Andrea. Yes, Greg. A Hat in Time sounds great. Honestly, I played <laughs> at E3 Judges Week. I can't wait to play it on consoles. I ain't fucking playing it on PC. If I want to know what came out today, Andrea, where would I go? You would go to the official list of upcoming software across each and every platform as listed by the kind of funny Games Daily show hosts each and every weekday. <laughs> what time is it? 
I, you gotta, it is 12.47. All right, keep me posted. Because I, I won 15, but then I didn't bring in a clock. Uh, out today, the Xbox One fall update is out. Go ahead and do that. You can customize your dashboard. I was using the old one yesterday. I don't think I had the new one downloaded yet, so I'm excited to see what this is all about. Uh, don't Knock Twice is on Switch. Alex is on Xbox One and PS4. I put PC here off the list, but I'm pretty sure I got released there. Gran Turismo Sport on PlayStation 4. Keep it connected at all times online or you're <laughs> fucked. Megaton Rainfall on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation VR. This is the one that has you flying around like Superman doing stuff. I will be investigating. Rogue Trooper Redux, Xbox One, PS4, PC, and Switch. South Park, The Fractured Butthole, Xbox One, PS4, and PC. Again, I like it a lot. Uh, WWE 2K18 Regular Edition on Xbox One, PlayStation 4, Switch, and PC. It says Switch. It's not on a Switch yet. That's a misprint. Uh, Boko Suka Wars 2 on PlayStation 4. Chaos Semicolon Child on PlayStation 4 and Vita. Anytime there's a semicolon and the words are shoved together, you bet your ass that's coming to Vita. <laughs> Dungeons 3, Xbox One, PlayStation 4. Hex Card Clash, PlayStation 4. The Jackbox Party Pack 4, Xbox One, PS4. Megaton Rainfall on here again. No, he no Heroes Allowed, VR, PlayStation VR. Summon Night 6, Lost Borders, PlayStation 4, Vita. Halo Recruit on PC. Luna on PC. And Torque L... Physics Modified Edition Xbox One. Then in terms of new dates, Ark Survival Evolved is getting an Xbox One X patch on October 25th. If you're planning to play that and get that patch, get on it. Time for reader mail. Andrea, yes, we're sir. starting with not Alex G, who's going to take us to task in a serious question. Okay. This isn't a question, but I wanted to respectfully say I feel like you and Andrea handled the Naughty Dog topic poorly yesterday. You both made it seem like Naughty Dog's statement was the best option to make. Aren't you the one, that, and he's talking to me, Greg, that is always saying how businesses and people should communicate clearly and in depth in situations that serious? A sexual harassment allegation is a serious allegation, way more serious than stupid loot boxes or poor online servers. We didn't need to hear Naughty Dog's lawyers talk for them. We needed to hear Naughty Dog talk sincerely about the matter. You and Andrea both went on and talked about other situations, and that was so disappointing for me. It's so wrong that your reaction was, quote, I'm biased towards both sides, end quote. You should never let fandom or existing relationships mute your opinions. Biasness is what allows these allegations to continue to happen. This is an interesting um, point because I had several people reach out to me privately to say that they liked the way that we handled it on the me show too. yesterday. Um, but of course, you know, everybody's entitled to their own opinions. Um, not Alex G, I would say to you, Naughty Dog was never going to be allowed to make a personal statement about this issue, which I said yesterday, mm -hmm. that the reason their lawyers were speaking for them, because if there's going to be some kind of further action taken, if David is going to press charges or go down a path of bringing a lawsuit or some kind of legal action against Sony and Naughty Dog, their lawyers are not going to allow them to say anything that could potentially incriminate them, which is why we got the response we got, which is what I said yesterday. So I'm not quite sure what you're so upset about. Yeah, I think well, I think the part, you know, aren't, aren't you the one saying businesses and people should communicate clearly and in depth in situations that seem serious? Yes. Absolutely. But I, here's the thing is that we've gone from regular season to the World Series here. Like, we're uh, yes, when your servers are down, why are they fucking down? You're, the game isn't out when it's supposed to be. Why is it delayed? What's happening? I want a human being to respond to that. When we're talking about someone being sexually harassed, maybe whatever sexually sexually assaulted in some way sexually harassed and that's what's happening here we are now into i completely understand the legal ramifications of why naughty dog can't come out and say he's a fucking liar or it did happen or so or we didn't know and i'm neil Druckmann, and i'm i mean again it goes back to what we we're talking about yesterday with empathy like i uh, and where i was talking about when you, you bring up the fact of like you know i'm biased towards both sides it wasn't that i'm biased about both sides it's that i know both sides in terms of people at naughty dog and you then david inherently himself. can't be biased for both sides that's just not the way logic works and so what i was dra dra dragging up yesterday or talking about yesterday was empathy and the fact that i totally understand why naughty dog's hands are tied and they have to say what they have to say and like you said a very a vanilla here's what we can say without incriminating or saying anything or the other option of like what a fucking bunch of assholes they would have been if it was a hey everybody I'm Neil I'm Evan whoever and this guy's fucking lying like that's not this look anybody wants in this situation they need to figure this out on themselves themselves let alone how you want it reflected for David and all these other things and given the timeliness of their response they probably didn't have enough 
of their research done to accurately um, address the situation. You know, this idea that their statement said that there was no evidence found of the allegations. I guarantee that they're digging through all of the records to find out what actually happened. If yeah. there were HR meetings, if there is a documentation about other kinds of meetings amongst supervisors to so make sure that they have the biggest picture. I, I mean, that's what they're going to have to do from a legal perspective. And maybe they just haven't concluded that investigation yet. And so they can't give a full response anyway. Yeah. It's a, it's a really tough situation. Of course we all want to hear their true feelings about it, but I don't know if we're ever going to get, you know, a, a statement about this specific allegations from naughty dog, you know, from a personal standpoint. I mean, and that's the thing is like, you know, their true feelings about it, right? Like there's no, there's uh, the true feelings are simple. I don't need to have quotes from anybody. If you're at not if you're at Naughty Dog, you either feel and didn't you didn't know about this, which I assume most you feel devastated and horrible for that one of your friends and colleagues and teammates is going through this or, or saying he went through this on the other side. Maybe you're angry about it. Like you can fill in all the emotions here. I don't need to see these people. I that's one of those. I understand what you've got to do and you've got to handle this yourselves and get to the bottom of what really happened and go from there and punish the parties involved that were at fault. And I mean that in all shapes and sizes of it. It's that Dave writes into kind of funny.com slash KFGD and says, Hey, Greg and Andrea. So you guys talked about the ugly ass battlefront Two <laughs> PlayStation four on Monday. And it got me curious on who actually makes these special edition PlayStation fours. Is it actually Sony or is it the video game publisher? So EA and Activision. Oh, so, so EA or Activision for that God awful call of duty one. Well, it'd be Activision. I don't know why you're bringing EA into that one. Uh, oh, sorry. Because if it is Sony, don't you think these companies would be like, come on, guys, really? Do something better. <laughs> love the show. Keep up the great work. And also, any word on the replacement host for good old Irish cream? Much love, Dave. <laughs> Dave, all options are on the table. Conversations are ongoing. I hope to be able to update you one day on a permanent, really, on a permanent replacement kind of thing. But Gary Wood is coming in this week, so we got that. Yay, Gary. Um... It's, it's Sony. It's PlayStation, right? I have to imagine that they're the ones leading the design here, and then their publishing partner or development partner probably has some kind of oversight into yeah. those designs. But, I mean, yeah, it's Sony's hardware. Yeah, so. I, when Destiny 2 was coming around, I was talking to them, and they are like, well, I don't, I don't, anything else you need? I'm like, we'd love one of them, Destiny Pro, PlayStation 4 Pros or whatever, because we've seen more PlayStation 4 Pros in the office. <laughs> and he's like, oh, that's PlayStation. you got to talk to them. I was like, oh, okay. Oh, okay, well then... But I don't know, but it's also... There has to be some, hey, we're not PlayStation. We're just taking your IP and making this thing and you have no say in it. Somebody's got to look right. at this, right, and say it. But I would also imagine it's somebody in marketing or whatever who's just like, yeah, that's great. I would like to be one of these meetings and talk to these people and be like, why? What was your what was going on inside why? your brain? That this why was, did you let this happen? This was the concept. It was funny because when we tweeted um, with Insomniac yesterday about the potential for uh, a Spider-Man um, PS4 Pro, um, so many people in my feed were like, I would gladly mock up designs for them. And it got me thinking that it would be such a fun thing to do to have a fan, fan art. Hell yeah. Yeah. Competition to see who can create the best mock up. I mean, they would have to make a disclosure like, listen, you're not getting paid. You're not getting royalties. You're not getting anything. This yeah. is just purely for the love of the love of the IP or whatever. But that would be, I think, a much better and way it's to a, do And it. it's a normal internet thing where they're a big company doing it. So they'd be eaten alive. Yeah. Oh, they're just trying to benefit off everyone else's hard work. Yeah, yeah. If somebody makes a cool kind of funny shirt, we're like, hey, can we sell it? We'll give you one or money. And they're like, no, nah, just mention my Twitter. I'm like, all right, great. Here's a shirt made by this person. Tons of fans do do art just for the love of the art. Sure. So I, I think well, there'd be plenty of people who would be willing to, to do it. This is back to season passes and loot boxes. <laughs> Everybody on the outside has an opinion on it. The people who actually care don't care. Yeah. They're like, oh, great. New shirts, whatever. <laughs> they're like, oh, what are people whining about today? But it's funny, Andrea <laughs> Renee, you bring up Spider Man Insomniac in a conversation we had on Twitter with Insomniac Games, the yes. company. It's just a sen sentient being over there. Yes. <laughs> Yesterday, we were talking, and we, we got into the weeds on first party, second party, and third party games, in which I, we, you said this is, was it? And I was like, well, isn't it second party? And I explained IPs and this, that, and the other, and we got to the point of like, fuck, what the fuck does second party mean anymore? What does it mean in 2017? Our friends at Insomniac either listen to the show or just were involved enough with us on Twitter arguing about it, that they laid it all out for us. Are you ready? Yes, ready. First off, Insomniac says, for Spider-Man, Sony Interactive Entertainment is the publisher of the game. Thus, it is a first-party game. So that's solidified and done. However, th and then I was like, well, what the fuck, though? What about second party? Because you're not owned by them and blah, blah, blah. Here's where we go. Insomniac says, second party doesn't really technically exist except to indicate outside studios doing a first-party game. 
So I was like, wait, that's you then, right? That's what's happening. And they go like this. Think of it more as inclusionary. Ratchet is a first party game. Insomniac is a second party developer. People made up second, I'm sorry, people made second party up to deal with Rare's status back in the day. No one really uses that in development. So when we make a when we make Ratchet parentheses or any other game with Sony and parentheses, we work with first party product uh, development, marketing, etc., like all first party games do. So that's where we are in 2017. Second party dead. It is now is it a first party game or or, or a first party publisher? Makes more sense. Publishers can be first or third. Games can be first or third. In that. Got it. There you go. Thank you, Insomniac. So we weren't wrong yesterday. We were just confused. <laughs> we're just old. We're old relics. I'm just an old beat up piece of meat. <laughs> the Wrestler. Great movie. Right, Kev? You like The Wrestler, Kev? Like I'm just an old beat up piece of meat. I'm actually doing the impression of The Wrestler <laughs> from the movie Heel Kick. Because they do that impression on there. So I'm doing Danny Mac doing Mickey Rourke. He'll kick the movie. <laughs> um, I want to give you. We got about ten. I'm gonna minutes. give you one good. Yeah. Well, no, we're right. We're right on time. We got here in the end. I'm gonna give you one more good one. How about that, Andrea? Okay. I'm gonna go to this one. We mentioned Shadow of War. Wet Dirt. Twenty eight has a question about it. According to MCVUK.com. Shadow of War is failing to live up to WB sales expectations, at least in the UK. MCV states that while Shadow of Mordor fans were clearly super keen to play the game and pre-ordered it in large numbers, it didn't then drive the mass sales Warner Brothers was hoping. End quote. How much of this is due to the loot box slash tribute DLC drama? The loot boxes and bad PR seem to have absolutely had an impact on the game sales, which is a shame because I'm loving the time I've spent with it so far. I've put in around 15 or 20 hours and I'm having an absolute blast and I've done so without spending an extra cent on loot boxes. I'm aware of the apparent grinding that is required in the game's fourth act, but I still plan on playing through that portion until I finish it or get bored. Again, I plan on doing so without purchasing a single loot box with real money. As it stands now, the game is absolutely worth the $60 purchase from a content and gameplay standpoint, but WB seems to have really shot themselves in the foot here with microtransactions. Thoughts? I disagree with you 100% wet dirt. Why is that, Greg? I do not. I when they before we knew anything about loot boxes and tributes, we were on this show, and I think it was Tim's episode, and it, it was like it's it's get, Shadow of War is getting the biggest marketing budget ever. It's bigger than Batman Arkham Knight, and I was like, that is a dumb move. Like that movie, that game's gonna sell well to its fans, but not. It's not gonna blow up. Shadow of Mordor didn't blow up. Shadow of Mordor, yeah, was almost like a dark horse when yeah. it won all of the awards that it won at the end of the year. I, but at, at launch, I don't think anybody thought it was going to, you know, topple any crazy records. I mean, I know. Granted, these are just UK numbers. Who knows? Maybe it's gone crazy off here, and, and NPD will change all the opinion on it. But like. When they announced this game and started talking about that, I was like, that seems like a bonehead move by WB in terms of marketing, in terms of projections, in terms of what you think. It didn't seem realistic that they thought they were going to, that they would get the payback on this and going that way. In terms of loot box tribute drama, I don't think it, it didn't stop you. It didn't stop Andrea. Tons nope. of people. I think and Andy Cortez is playing. Now, granted, these are people who are in the industry, blah, blah, blah. But you three, I know, or no, I don't actually don't know about that wet dirt. Well, I know wet dirt, but I didn't know his opinions on Shadow War. I, they, you were excited for it. Andy was excited about it. Loot box drama didn't stop anybody there. Again, this goes back to what I was just talking about in a cursory matter. But again, when the season pass gets announced, when loot boxes get announced, the entire video game internet fucking gets riled up and has an opinion. Were they ever going to buy the fucking game? I don't think they were. It's, it might be a case of the vocal minority here of people who are upset about loot boxes in this particular game, but the vast majority of consumers who buy AAA games at retail or even if they get a digital download are not watching these discussions. They're not reading, you know, gaming outlets. They're not listening to people like us. They're just going down to their local mom and crop shop and buying the game they want. <laughs> yeah. You know, like they don't know about the loot boxes probably that are even in the game. That's until why they everybody get to wants them. to put them on the box and warn them, right? It might be also a contributing reason why the publishers are making so much money off of them because most people are like, oh, cool. There's a thing I can buy. I oh, like nice. what I it can gives try me. To get this faster. They don't know about the controversy around them. Yeah. Again, because it's this, it's this, it's the push and pull of our industry, where there is a side of 
it's art, it's this. Gran Turismo has always been single player and great. And then there's the side of, I'm here to play games. I'm here to escape my normal life and play this for 10 hours, 10, 10, 15 minutes, a couple hours a night and go about my business and never check in on any of the drama and not know any of this shit. So I don't think it was because of the drama surrounding microtransactions. I don't either. I'm sure they did lose some sales. I'm sure there is a percentile there that was like, I'm going to hold off and see what happens with reviews and yada, yada. I mean, but I don't think that. Yeah. No, that not a substantial amount. They're underperforming because WB was like, this thing is going to sell like hotcakes. And you're like, it doesn't even fucking say Lord of the Rings in the title. I don't care that it's not supposed to or some agreement with Tolkien's body. <laughs> it's time to squat up. That's <laughs> where one of you writes in kind of funny.com slash KFGD. You give me your name, your platform, your username and the game you need help in and why we read it here. The best friends come find you. Everybody plays together and it's a lovely time in a great community. Today's squad up is Zach. Zach needs help on PlayStation 4. I'm going to read his name, put an underscore between every word. Infro we trust. F-R-O. Infro, like Afro, we trust. Zach says, hey, Greg and Andrea. I've been hooked by Fortnite Battle Royale. It's becoming my go-to game when I want to play something and listen to a show. Would love to play with some kind of funny best friends. Thanks for everything you guys do. Have a great day. Infro we trust with underscores. Not after trust, just in between all the words. So not before in either. Just in between. If there's words touching, put an underscore in there. Similar to Nick Scarpino. Andrew. Yes, Greg. What do we get wrong today? Let me refresh the page real quick. Remember, if you're watching live, you need to go to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong. Tell us what we screw up as we screw it up. So we set the record straight for everybody watching later on youtube.com slash kindoffunnygames or listening on podcast services around the globe. What do capitalist pigs say now? <laughs> Shrubton says, super important correction here. Portillo's is in Buena Park, not in Anaheim. Bang my dick. You knew what I meant. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I did. I did. It's more painful for me. I don't know why that would be a thing. Oh, my gosh. It is in Buena Park, though. You should go. I don't think it has my photo up yet. So, um, capitalist pig has brought... An interesting, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily call it an editorialization, maybe a clarification on okay. the Amy Hennig story. He says, while Amy Hennig has not made an official statement, Jason Schreier is stating, an EA spokesperson tells me we are in discussions with Amy about her next move. Interesting. And then on Twitter, uh, that was from Twitter. So on Kotaku, it says, continues, a development team from across Worldwide Studios will take over development of Ragtag, which is a code name, led by the EA Vancouver team that has already been working on the project, which is what I read in their statement. Executive producer Steve Anthony will lead this team and will use much of the work that has been done to date by Visceral. It appears that Amy Hennig is out. Wow. wow. Which would be such a travesty <laughs> if wow. that's true. Um we didn't say this was did you say was the first time that this is breaking news has happened on the show i i, I think i meant the, if i said it i thought i clarified of this magnitude that like something real crazy was happening oh well this is a good one then mr yasman 300 says this isn't the first time a breaking news happened on games daily tim and danny got the news of bruce straley's leaving not a dog as a breaking okay, news well shows I'm i mean on. that's you know that I mean? is big news but i would i would argue that the news about visceral being shut down is much bigger news in this fucking star wars game all over the place yeah well i yeah. love bruce don't get me wrong but yeah i agree with that um, Capitalist Pick says Shadow of War does not need to be online, but if you start online and get kicked off, you need to restart the game. That's mm. dumb. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. That's good to know. But I mean, I'm not going to disconnect the internet from my Xbox One to start it offline in case my internet disconnects while I'm playing. Dumb. That is the weirdest thing I've heard. Just give you a warning, you know? Oh my goodness. Okay. There are reports that if you just flat out refuse to accept the online license, the game runs fine, but with the in-game market disabled. That's good to know. This is Shadow of War. Shadow of War. Okay. Um, this is another person who said um, about the Shadow of War offline. I really they watch. say that they were playing on PS4 and turned off their internet in the middle of playing and nothing happened. So PS4 I still for could the win. play as normal. You got you got screwed by your Xbox. I'm waiting for that Xbox One X. It's going to look so pretty. Um, next, it says. Oh, this may be a bit long in the tooth for your wrong, so feel free to skip. So should I skip? Yeah, go ahead and skip. <laughs> you got places to be. Um. Oh my gosh, this is 
this is like such a like a nitpicky thing, but I'm gonna read it just so you feel better about yourself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Alexander Fifty said, Andrea mentioned that many people don't have access to high speed internet and gave the example of five uh, megabytes per second. Home internet speeds are measured in megabits per second. MP. Andrea, MBPS, you fucking idiot. Not megabytes. Get out of here! You sicken me. Five megabytes per second is roughly forty megabits per second. Which is high speed internet. FCC defines high speed as twenty five. Now he's MBPS just now he's just a piece higher. of shit. I love it. I <laughs> hope I hope you go around today saying I won today. <laughs> you did it. Um <laughs> Xanthus Sarah says in regards to Tiny Metal was announced earlier this year and has been in two Nintendo Directs. Okay. While it looks like a full 3D Advance Wars war groove by Chucklefish, who made Stardew Valley and Pocket Rumble, yeah. looks to be a full spiritual successor to Advance Wars in all of its sprite based glory. Well, sign me up. All right. <laughs> we need some Advance Wars in this piece. Um, they wanted to, this next person, um, Ignoranus, wants to add to the FTC discussion, but that's not what you're wrong is for. If you would like to add to the discussion, please write us to kindoffunny.com slash KFGD. Just like so many of you did. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching Kind of Funny Games Daily. Remember, each and every weekday on a variety of platforms, we run you through the nerdy video game news you need to know about. You can watch live on twitch.tv slash kindoffunnygames. Watch later on youtube.com slash kindoffunnygames. Listen on podcast services around the globe. No matter where you get the show, thank you so much for your support. You are all amazing human beings. I hope you have a great day. Play some games. And until next time, no, it's been our pleasure to serve you. <laughs>